The Florida Community of Mindfulness is happy to make these talks available to you. If you find this talk to be a benefit, please consider making a donation to support us. You'll find a donation button on the Talks section of our website, floridamindfulness.org. Thank you, and may you be happy and free of suffering. This is a text uh, that I really haven't taught in a while, and it's not a Buddhist text, and mostly I teach from Buddhist texts. It's called the Hua Wu Jing. And for those of you who know uh, Chinese, please forgive me for, uh, <laughs> for, for butchering the language. And it's, it's uh, called the Unknown Teaching of Lao Tzu, and many of you, I think, maybe know Lao Tzu from your own reading, the Tao Te Ching, uh, you know, very... Uh, and uh, Taoism is this kind of pre-Buddhist uh, Chinese uh, uh, teaching and practice, ancient. And so these are called the unknown teachings because uh, you know we're familiar with the Tao Te Ching, and this this text supposedly, according to the uh, the translator, uh, was uh, 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 another text uh, of uh, Lao Tzu, who was, and then for some reason during a time of uh, political repression, all the copies were burnt. And uh, supposedly it was just preserved sort of in the oral tradition of uh, Taoist masters. And then uh, some Taoist master, uh, obviously uh, recently, uh, this was translated in the 70s, uh, came to this country, transmitted the teachings uh, to this uh, man, Brian Walker, who is a, a poet and a writer. And this is his translation. Uh, so again, it's a little bit of an apocryphal text, and well as uh, I think the translator uh, is, a, is a poet. So I think he brings his own sensibilities to this, uh, because uh, it's, it's a fairly modern uh, kind of translation. Uh, so anyway, for some reason I thought of uh, teaching from it today. When I, came, I had something else prepared, I was going to talk about boredom. And I was kind of bored with that subject after preparing for it, so I, uh, <laughs> I'll talk a little about that uh, in two weeks. And uh, for some reason, I went to the shelf and picked this one. So, uh, it has um, uh, 70, 80, 81 verses. So these are all in verse. And so I just picked out a few. So this is verse uh, 77. Uh, so let me, let me begin. Humanity grows more and more intelligent, yet there is clearly more trouble and less happiness daily. So obviously for, for a teaching that purports to be, you know, thousands of years old, already I think uh, there's something very contemporary about this, isn't it? Humanity grows more and more intelligent, yet there is clearly, yet there is clearly more trouble and less happiness daily. How can this be so? Obvious question. It is because intelligence is not the same as wisdom. And this is very important because, uh, and especially, uh, you know, these days, especially in Western culture, but I think now it's uh, uh, becoming more universal, that uh, a certain kind of intellectualism, a certain kind of intelligence uh, being intelligent, being, or how about we, we call it smart, right? There are a lot of smart people around, aren't there? And there are a lot of smart people in all areas of our society, right? All the professions and, and in politics. And, you know, where there's, our, our country is run by smart people. Would we agree? In, in, the, in the same, well, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I didn't say wise people. You see, he's making, and I think this is, and I think, I think this is a very important distinction because we're off, 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 often fooled because we go, how can smart people be, be, you know, in a certain sense, be so stupid? You know, how could people who are, who are intelligent, you know, you say, well, they graduated from here and they graduated from there and they interned under the, you know what I mean? So I go, you know, these are obviously intellectually intelligent people, Right. They are competent in their fields. And yet we go, but yet, you know, the the decisions they make, the choices they make, the values they seem to have, seem so wrong. 
And so I think this is, I think this is very, this sheds a lot of light on something that bothers us. Uh, because again, we live in a society that values intelligence, right? We, 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 uh, we, uh, we evaluate people and we esteem people because of their credentials, right? Their, their, their degrees. You see what I'm saying? And, we, and so, uh, but he's positing here that wisdom and intelligence are not the same thing, right? One can have a very high IQ. One can be very good in their field, very intelligent, right? But yet be very challenged in having any wisdom. So he says, when a society misuses partial intelligence and ignores holistic wisdom, it's people forget the benefits of a plain and natural life. So what is this holistic wisdom, right? That people uh, uh, ignore in our society. Well, traditionally in Buddhism or in Taoism, it, he says it's holistic. It sees the whole. It sees the interconnection of the parts, right? It sees, the, it sees the inseparability of human beings and nature and life, you know, of the rich and the poor, right? Of the oppressors and the oppressed, right? Again, of human beings and nature and the world. Holistic wisdom sees connections, sees interdependence, how we are all dependent on one another, right? But partial people who don't have that wisdom, that holistic wisdom, and only have this kind of partial intelligence, it means their intelligence is just in their field, right? And so we look at people's credentials in their field and they may be very smart, right? As I say, you know, based on their credentials, uh, you know, the heads of our country and the heads of uh, a lot of our institutions you know, are intelligent people, right? They're not stupid in that sense, but they lack wisdom. Is that clear? They don't see clearly. They don't see that we are all brothers and sisters. We're all of the same family. We either rise up together or we go down together. Right? They don't see that. They, they, they are just partial. They have partiality. They choose one over the other. They don't see how we're all inseparable and interconnected. So when a, when a society misuses partial intelligence, so it's not only having partial intelligence, you know, one can have partial intelligence, but at least have a little humility. Do you see what I'm saying? But when you don't have humility, when you don't see the limits of your own intelligence, and you think your, your, your limited intelligence or your, your partial view of things is giving you the whole view, you don't have that holistic wisdom, then they, he, well, he, he says, it's people forget the benefits of a plain and natural life, seduced by their desires, emotions, and egos. Sound familiar? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's what I'm saying. It's so contemporary. <laughs> Seduced by their desires, emotions, and egos, they become slaves to bodily demands, to luxuries, to power, and unbalanced religion and psychological excuses. Um, see, I'm saying, so, again, it's, since, since we don't have the original text, we don't know... But, you know, so we don't know how free this translation is, uh, but however how free it is, I think it's very incisive and very contemporary and speaks to us. Seduced by their desires, emotions, and egos, they become slaves to bodily demands, to luxuries, to power, unbalanced religion, and psychological excuses. Right? And if we see, as all of we have seen, the drama that unfolds, 
uh, on the national stage over these past years and months and weeks. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Right? That's what's being acted out on the, nat- on, on the national stage. This partial intelligence, this lack of wisdom, right? And this basically commitment primarily to oneself, right? To one's own ego or the ego of like-minded egos, you know, you know that's where the commitment is, and, and especially to power. And I think this, you know, unbalanced religion, right? We, we know that so much of, of what passes for religion these days is a religion that picks and chooses, right? It picks certain teachings and leaves out other teachings. It's not balanced. It's not willing to take in the, 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 the holistic development of, of whatever their religion is, which I think, is, I think there's wisdom in all religions, but they choose to pick certain sides, certain views, certain ideas, and completely leave out others. And so we have, uh, you know, what's passing, uh, you know, for a lot of our traditional religions uh, is this partiality. And I think, uh, and so he says, and psychological excuses, I mean, Do I need to belabor that one? Uh, We we live in a world where we excuse uh, such corruption, such uh, moral uh, deadness, such lack of a moral compass or the effects of one's actions on others by simply, uh, you know, what do people do? They hire a PR group and it comes up with a wonderful kind of psychologically sound excuse for why I did it. But there's a lot of, you know, you, you get the sense that there's an insincerity in it. A real, very personal coming to grips with the effects of one's actions and lots of rationalization. So, seduced by their desires, emotion, and egos, they become slaves to bodily demands, to luxuries, to power, unbalanced religion, psychological excuses, and then the reign of calamity and confusion begins. So it's important that we hear these kinds of teachings. Why is it important? Because when you're, when you're in the reign of calamity and confusion and don't understand that that's what it is, and if our viewpoint is very partial to like what's going on right now, we get what? Confused. We lose our clarity. Right? We lose, we lose our ground. Right? And, and we get caught up in all kinds of uh, afflictive, negative emotionality. I mean, everybody, I don't need to go into that. All you need to have done is just paid attention to the national discourse over these prior weeks and months and years. You, you see what's going on. Right? So it is important. We often say that Buddhism, you know, a spiritual path gives us big picture so we can make sense of the small picture. If we can't make sense of the small picture, we will be overwhelmed by the day-to-day unfoldings in our world, right? We will be, give rise to anger, and bitterness, fears, anxiety, sadnesses, despair, or, or we could be just come indifferent. You know, but I think if we have understanding, we understand the bigger picture of what's unfolding and why it's unfolding. In other words, we have wisdom. Right? Then we have a means of, of dealing uh, to this age of calamity and confusion. And I think that's very apropos. I mean, even if this translation was done back in the early 90s, you know, all you can say uh, 10, 20, 25 years later, Little did he know what confusion and calamity could look like in our world, right? Nonetheless, 
superior people. Now he's talking about us. <laughs> but this is not like a superior people over inferior people. I mean, this is a different, it's a kind of terminology that was used then. Superior people meaning people who, who rise above the fray, who are not totally caught and lost in this calamity and confusion with all the afflictive emotions, etc. But people who can rise above it. And, and I think, I mean, the, in that sense, superior people, it means to me, people who are willing to take the high path, the noble path in life, right? And, and raise themselves up. And that's what it means, superior. It's not like we're superior over anybody but we're willing to take the superior path in life, the path of wisdom, the path of understanding, the path of compassion, and not the path of partial intelligence. Nonetheless, superior people can awaken during times of turmoil to lead others out of the mire. Right? So in, in Buddhism, we call this the Bodhisattva way. You know, in other words, most people, probably of all political sides and their various philosophical views at this point in contemporary America would, would, would agree. They may have a tiffle, different uh, stance on it, uh, you know, that we are in a, in a time of great confusion and calamity, right? But what do we do? Do we continue to, uh, to get stuck in the morass of that confusion and calamity? Do we turn our backs on it with indifference? Or do we make the choice to lead others out of the mire? And this is significant. This is a, a, a very existential human choice point for each of us. Can we all agree on the confusion? We all agree on the calamity. We all agree there's a lack of wisdom, a holistic wisdom that's really uh, pervasive in our culture at all. We see the suffering, we see the divisiveness, we see the anger, we see the suffering. What, what, what is my response, right? What is my response to that? Am I going to be, as, as they say, uh, you know, uh, what do they say? If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I mean, it's kind of a corporate little thing, you know, but it's, 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 but it's, it has some truth to it. You know, are, gonna, are we just going to be ones who are part of the problem, caught up in this divisiveness and the separateness and this, you know, just responding to situation to situation, right? Or do we want to look at really what's going on here, look deeply into our society, into the causes of this, and do I want to help, help free people, free our brothers and sisters in this world, free our family, free our society from the very causes that are creating uh, this kind of systemic suffering and confusion and divisiveness in our, in our society. And then he says a very obvious uh, question. But how can the one liberate the many? Right? 
And that's often our response. But I'm just one. What can I do? Right? I'm just one person, or there's just a few of us. You know, how can I really change the course of this world? And his first answer is by first liberating one's own being. This is very uh, significant. And I think it's very difficult uh, for people uh, growing up in sort of a a society uh, like we grew up in, a society that is, uh, you know, it's very awash uh, with politics, right? I mean, you know, we are a democracy. Politics is the kind of lifeblood of democracy. Uh, So... uh, uh, you know, so uh, participation in the public sphere, voting, taking stands on policies, you know what I mean? This is, this is, what, this is our way of changing society, right? And again, I'm not uh, disputing uh, that, that uh, these kinds of political decisions and policy decisions, policy decisions uh, don't change the outer course of society. But what if you think the problem is not just a lack of foresight in policy and politics, but the problem is the lack of wisdom within human beings, you see. If you say, as one can't help look at the politics of today and go, gee, I thought we settled that one 50 years ago. You see? Right? Because we, you know, we passed a, you know, uh, uh, a bill, or we passed a new act, or we, you know see what I'm saying? We go, you know, I thought we're done with that one. I thought society's moving on. And yet, here we are again. Why is that? Right? Because we may change the structures of our society. And again, as we are learning, depending on what side of the, uh, of the political you, you go, yeah, you can just, when you get in power, you can just what? Change it back. And then change it back. And then change it back. Right? That's... And we go, how can that be? Well, because we thought that by changing the superstructure of society, we, we could change human beings. And the problem is, as he says, there's a lack of wisdom, holistic wisdom, this basic understanding how things really are and our interconnections, our inseparability, our interdependence on each other and all life. Right. So how can one liberate the many? By first liberating one's own being. Doesn't mean we don't vote. It doesn't mean we don't get involved in the... In, in the body politic. But it means that we understand that an awakened society is created by only by awakened people. A compassionate society is only created by compassionate people. Right? A wise society is only created when at least there's a significant number of wise people around. Right? A nonviolent society is only created by people who are living in a nonviolent way. A nonviolent society is only created by people who live by nonviolence. And that, unfortunately, takes a certain level of commitment to personal transformation. And so we see that in the Bodhisattva way, even though one is beginning by really focusing very deeply on one's own transformation, it is always in the service of wanting to benefit others. But we understand, how can I really benefit others and free them of their own suffering if I haven't done that to myself? How can I create a society free of hatred if I still have hatred in me? Right? 
So I have to be willing to look at myself and say, I need to really become the person I want the world to be. I can't wait. I can't think it's going to happen through politics. Even though, you know, the composition of the Supreme Court and the composition of the House and the Senate and the governors, you know, it's not as if in the short run, these aren't, you know, these don't mean different things, you understand? But it's understanding it's never going to change unless human beings begin to change because the problem is in human beings, unfortunately. Nevertheless, superior people can awaken during times of turmoil to lead others out of the mire. How can one liberate the many? By first liberating one's own being. And then he says, one does not do that by elevating oneself, but by lowering oneself. One lowers oneself into that which is simple, modest, true. And this is a lowering into the kind of the simplicity of life. Letting go of the complexity, letting go of all the endless needs and wants and endless ambitions, you know, that so consume us. And just can I come back to a simpler life, a simpler self? (laughs) One lowers oneself to that which is simple, modest, true integrating that into oneself. Then one becomes a master of simplicity, modesty, and truth. It's sort of like we come out of here and we come down into here. (laughs) Sort of like in our meditation, right? You know, I think there's one of the key things of our society that people often respond, uh, especially people who are in charge, is they say, well, this is too complex for ordinary people to understand, right? Right? Only, Only people of advanced understanding and experience could possibly uh, understand the complexity of these decisions. But is that really true? Right? You know, how complex is to when we see injustice, to just name it as injustice. When we see suffering, to just name it as in suffering. When we see hatred, to just name it as hatred. When we see intolerance, to just name it as intolerance. And when we see goodness, to name it as goodness. When we see compassion, to name it as compassion. When we see kindness, we name it as compassion, you know? You don't have to have any education to understand that. Actually, probably if you have less education, it's probably easier <laughs> in a certain sense. Uh, we're often fooled by complexity. You know, it's sort of like we, we get lost in the trees. And we don't see the whole forest. In the next verse it says, completely emancipated from one's former false self, one discovers one's original pure nature, which is the pure nature of everything. And this really, you know, I think the idea behind uh, simplicity, modesty, truth is we stop endlessly going out. We are a world where we're endlessly going out. We're endlessly thinking about all kinds of things, worrying about all kinds of things, angry about all kinds of things, resentful about all kinds of things. Right? 
complexity. But he says, come back. Discover your own pure nature. You know, when Brian was saying, now we bow to the Buddha. Right, remember that? Now we bow to the Buddha. The Buddha, the representation of our own true nature, pure nature. And the capacity of each of us to awaken to that. So that's really what we're doing. You know, even, even, in, your, even in our meditation today, what are the instructions? Relax, right? Everybody here comes to, <laughs> you know, or many people come this week, they come to Sunday Sangha, Sunday meditation with complexity, right? We got a lot going on upstairs. So. Concerns and stories and dramas and worries and planning and, uh, you know, issues and, right? Complexity. And the first instruction is let go. In this moment, let go and return to the utter simplicity of you, of you. That underneath this endlessly bubbling, bubbling, frothing of thoughts and feelings and emotions and perceptions, there is a stable, quiet place. That's very pure and undefiled. It is the very nature of your mind, the very nature of your experience. It's the ground. And yet we, we don't hang out on the ground floor. We're always up somewhere on the 25th floor. Right? And we often get lost. We need to return to the ground. And what can be more grounded than sitting here aware that I'm breathing, right? Sitting here, aware that I'm sitting here. I have a body. You know, I mean, like for many people, that's like a, a revolutionary discovery. You know, I have a body. I am physical. I see, I smell, I hear, I taste, you know. There's a whole life that's going on within me that's very simple very basic, very human, and is me. But we identify with what? Our thoughts, our stories. And our stories, because we have a fairly um, embroidered life and a embroidered life history, we have many, 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 many stories about who we are and who the world is and who this one is and who that one and who did what and who didn't do what and who should have done what, and, right? It's very complex. Can we learn to just put it all down? Right? Because the basis of a story is a story is made up. That's why we call them stories. These are our stories about ourselves and life. You know? Most of us, even when we read, we don't read nonstop, do we? Oh, okay. I'll put down the book. Right? It's a work of fiction. Just come back to myself. Meditation, mindfulness, is a way of coming back to ourselves. Not only in meditation, but as we go through our day, we learn to be mindful in daily life. When we're eating, just eat. I mean, that's what we're doing, isn't it? Sounds kind of bizarre to have to say that. But when we eat, many of us aren't even aware of what we're eating. We're not really tasting. We're thinking or we're talking. We're, we're not present to the utter simplicity of our experience. When we're walking, we're not just walking not present to nature, not present to our bodies. We practice walking meditation. here. Why do we do that? How crazy. Right? Why is that? Because we've even lost the capacity of being present to ourselves as we walk. We are what? We are thinking. Past, present, future. I mean, just, not just in our bodies, present to the experience we're having. 
Okay? So what he's calling for, this discovering of our original pure nature, which is the nature of the universe, is something that we discover in our meditative practice and in our daily life mindfulness meditative practice. It's something we just, when he talks about, we want to emancipate ourselves from our false self. Well, many of us don't have a clue what our false self is. Right? Like, you know, to have a false self, you have to have, you have to have, know that you have a real self. You have to know that there's something called my real self, and therefore my false selves are not really me. We have to know that the masks we wear in life are just masks. They're not really me. We know the person who's wearing the mask. And meditation, coming back home, coming back to our true self, is the means of discovering our true self. When you discover your true self, you know all your false selves immediately. Right? I often use the example, you know, like if you, you know, like Halloween or something, you know, some of these masks that people wear these days, you know, they're no longer, you know, when I was a kid, you know, it was like, you know, you put on a white sheet or something and made some eyes and you were a ghost, you know what I mean? That was like scary, you know? Uh, but you know these, these masks that they have these days are scary, right? And if somebody, you know, if you're in your house and all of a sudden somebody came around the corner with one of those masks on, you go, ah, right? But if you knew who it was under the mask, right? You knew it was your friend or your family. You, see what, you know what I mean? You still might find that a little, the mask a little unsettling but you wouldn't be scared because you know who's behind it. Do we know who's behind our masks, the masks we present to the world, the masks we identify with? Do we know ourselves deeper than our false selves? Sometimes in life you have to put on masks, right? At work oftentimes we have to put on a mask. If we don't know it's a mask, if we don't know our true self from our false self, then in a certain sense we are lost because we don't know what's real. Right? If I know my mask is not real, I'm not concerned how people, you know, take it because I don't identify with it. Freely and spontaneously releasing our pure Buddhic energy. We constantly transcend complicated situations and draw everything back into oneself, into an integral oneness. How does that sound? Freely and spontaneously releasing one Buddha energy, one's true energy. Constantly transcending complicated situations and drawing everything back into an integral oneness. Sound pretty good? Yeah. What does that mean? So it's sort of the way I would think, it's sort of like if we have not returned to our true home within ourself. And this is not just meaning, you know, the breath. It means something more profound. It's like I know who I am at a very deep and essential way. In Zen, there's a koan that says, who was I before my parents were born? Right? See, that's like a little bit of a mind twister. Because we go, well, I know I got my body, I know I got my genetic makeup and everything, from my parents, but is there an essential me that was not conditioned by, by my genes, by my experiences in life? Like, who is the real me? What is the real me? You see, uh, 
when we know that, when we return to that, through this kind of meditative uh, calming, this meditative of concentrating, this meditative of kind of looking more deeply behind the mask, behind the fabrication, underneath the thoughts. You know, who am I really? When one knows that, then one no longer has to live, uh, and I'll use the word uh, artificially, with artifice. You know, many people, because they don't know themselves, because they're not comfortable with themselves, are always acting in life, you know, by trying to figure out how I'm supposed to act. Right? How I'm supposed to show up for this person. How I'm supposed to show up in that person. How I'm supposed to show up in terms of how I think I should show up. The way I want the world to see me. And oftentimes that image is all about, this is how I get to feeling valued or worthy or loved or liked or, you know? But can you see, it's all artifice. It's all being manufactured. And that takes a lot of energy to live that way. Animals don't live that way, do they? They don't have artifice. They're just who they are. Young children are that way. We were all young children. We were all very nat. We were who we are, right? Even as young children. You know, many of us, our parents, or those of you who have children, you know, you say, yeah, kind of, they were, they were who they were from a very early age, and they were very different. You know what I mean? Before they went to school and learned all, you know, they were, they were who they were. And though they've grown and it's 10, 20, 30, 40, their essential kind of, the way they are, remains. See, how many of us still know ourselves that way? How many of us have lost that? We've entered the worlds of false life, false living, false self. So when we return to our true self, when we know our true self, then we can live, he uses the words, freely and spontaneously. We trust. We trust. We're confident. We're relaxed. We show up in life in all situations just responding in a very natural way. We're relaxed. We're at ease. We're not trying to figure things out anymore. It's a very wonderful place to be. And this is the benefits of kind of doing this kind of work on oneself. The kids are here today? Yeah. So let's talk about this for a few moments. What do, you, what do you think about this? Let me just read it all again. It's so beautiful. Humanity grows more and more intelligent, yet there is clearly more trouble and less happiness daily. How can this be so? It is because intelligence is not the same thing as wisdom. When a society misuses partial intelligence and ignores holistic wisdom, its people forget the benefits of a plain and natural life. Seduced by their desires, emotions, and egos. They become slaves to bodily demands, to luxuries, to power, unbalanced religion, psychological excuses. Then the reign of calamity and confusion begins. Nonetheless, superior people can awaken during times of turmoil to lead others out of the mire. How can one liberate the many? By first liberating one's own being. One does this by not elevating oneself, but by lowering oneself. One lowers oneself to that which is simple, modest, true. Integrated into oneself, one becomes a master of simplicity, modesty, truth. Completely emancipated from one's former self, one discovers one's own pure nature, the pure nature of the universe. Freely and spontaneously releasing this energy, one constantly transcends complicated situations and draws everything around oneself back into an integral oneness. Any thoughts about this?
any questions about this? What does this mean? You know, we always like to not just make this like sermonizing up here. Don't want you to come to a weekly sermon. But how, do you, how would you take this into your life? How do you respond to the calamity and the turmoil of this world of ours? This confusion. So many people confused. How can we take this in? And how can we, you know, how do we make this choice? That I will be one to help end the confusion. I will be one who helps lead people out of the mire. How does one bring uh, simplicity, modesty, trueness into one's life? How does one let go of false self? I mean, these are all, you know, practical. You know, it sounds big, but we have to take it to, you know, how do I do it? So any questions about how to do it, how to integrate it? I think it's a question. I think it's a Daily practice. So let me just repeat. Is it something very small? It's something that we can do mm-hmm. on our own. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it brings you into the essential emptiness, I guess you'd say. Yeah, so what is being shared for those who can't hear and for those on live stream is it really comes down, down to daily practice. We can read about it, we can think about it, we can hear talks about it, uh, we can talk to each other about it, right? And yet, the actual transformative experience only comes when we begin to practice it, to practice these teachings in a very real way. And how do we have to do it? Daily. (laughs) Because where do we live our life? Day to day. Right, And so if we're going to transform ourselves, transform our lives, transform all these things, there has to be a way that we are attendant, that we attend to this transformation within ourself, this recalibration within ourself, moment to moment, day to day. Uh, without that, it is, it is very uh, difficult to really uh, get enough energy. And I think a lot of people on you know, with spiritual intentions or spiritual paths or, or good, good intentions, religion, you know, all that, it's, it's all good. But if there isn't this consistency of practice, this consistency of intention and aspiration, it's very hard to realize the benefits, you know, just because it takes this consistency. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if I disagree, but I would just say, uh, yeah, the question really boils down to uh, isn't wisdom sort of an intellectual process, so we need to value one's intellectual's capacity, the the capacity to understand, right? The capacity to what? 
Yeah, I don't see that's interesting. I think um, wisdom comes from thinking. I think wisdom comes from a certain kind of thinking. Yeah, and he calls it holistic thinking. See, to me, wisdom is big picture. Again, wisdom is, you know, a wise person. You know, we could all live, you know, we could have all lived the same life, gone through the same experiences, many of us, right? I mean, and, I mean, different. But a wise person is somebody who looks at all that and pulls out the kernel, pulls out, you know, sees, sees the theme, okay, right? Non-wise people don't see the theme or they already have an intellectual view that they impose on reality. I mean, the interesting thing about Buddhist philosophy and psychology it comes out of looking into reality. It's not a theology that imposes itself, right? And it's, you know, it's big picture. If you look at the teachings like the Four Noble Truths, one of these fundamentals of Buddhism, it comes from the Buddha observing life, right? You know, seeing what's going on in life and really kind of seeing the big picture, the big themes, right? So that's, it's this holistic. So. It does involve sort of an intellectual process, but there's a difference between wisdom and sort of this partial intelligence. And I think that's, that's what's being said here. Uh, because I think in our culture, we don't, we don't think that way. I think we are so alienated or lost contact with really wise people, right? That, that what we call a successful person is often a person who's very bright and they know how to do what? Make money. I mean, those are our heroes. Right? Right? The inventors, the entrepreneurs, the people who develop new technologies. Now, I'm not saying that that may not have its social, or I'm not even getting into it. But what is, I mean, those are just people who are very good at what? Developing things. And, and, and developing things or taking ideas or technologies to make money at. Now, I'm not going to get into that. But that's not wisdom. Wisdom is concerned with the fundamentals of, of, of human life and human suffering and how to create happiness for beings. So it's historically a very different animal. Uh, but again, um, you know, that, a lot of that is not present in, in the dialogue in our culture. That's the way it is. Are there other questions about how do you bring this into your life? Yes. So you're, if I hear you right, you're saying you're, the, the way you would actualize that is sort of by uh, keeping a distance from the world, observing the world, not getting too involved in it. And sort of, so you'd build kind of like a barrier. Uh, you, you, you. Put up a barrier. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just. And then I hear the kids. Uh, yeah. So that's a good question. You know. I mean. So how do you respond to the world? Do you put up a barrier? Do you put up a wall? You know, do you wall yourself off? Especially if it affects you. You know, and I think ideally we want to find that middle place where we can be in the world, but not deeply affected. I mean, we want to be affected. I mean, in the face of suffering, you know, we want to, we want to acknowledge suffering. We want to have a compassionate response. So we don't, it's dangerous to get to a place of not feeling of not, you know, but the question is, we only need to take in enough 
that we are present and responsive to the world, but not too much. And I think that's what we do these days. We take in too much. So it kind of disables us, right? But to find that balance, it takes time. And sometimes there has to be more of a stepping back. You know, and uh, there's, a, there's this uh, kind of metaphor in, in India that says, and if you ever go to India, you'll see it, you know, because of these buffaloes and cows that are wandering about everywhere, when they put a new tree in, they'll put a little fence around it, right? Because the tree is weak and, and the cows will eat it. But, they, but when the tree is maybe five years old or eight years old, they'll take the fence away because now it has bark. You know, uh, the, the cow won't eat it. And so sometimes in the beginning when we, when we acknowledge, yeah, I just got to take, I got to take a little more of a break now so I can kind of get my act together. But the act is always to return, right? But every, everyone is different, but I think one has to, you know, but I think certainly we need to uh, uh, limit, be more limiting to uh, the, uh, you know, the news and the, and the afflictive stuff we take in, because for most people it just riles us up one way or the other. Not very helpful. So good. If the children are here, uh, we'll stop now. Thank you.